You know, as a traveler, you're oftentimes asked to do things that, let's be honest, current and permanent staff oftentimes aren't asked to do. And one of those biggest things is being asked to float. It just seems to be one of those job descriptions and job duties that has been, I guess, affiliated and, and thrust upon travelers since this industry was created. And sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes you can do it. Lots of times it's one of the biggest pet peeves that travelers have. So we're going to talk about being floated on this week's edition of Travel Evolved. Welcome to Travel Evolved, everyone. We're going to talk about being flow today. I am Mark Holloway, your host. Is that what I am? I'm a host. I guess I'm a host. I don't know. I'm the. I'm the. the I, again, yeah. I guess that's the best word I can use to describe what I do. I got. I could use some other words. I'm sure some of you could too. But we're going to leave it as a host. Look, at, I'm even doing the, the obligatory newspaper or anchorman uh, shuffle, not newspaper. <laughs> I should start this whole thing all over again, but I'm not going to. Because that's how we roll at Travel Evolved. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Uh, episode 59. Man, this second season is just flying by. I'm in Southern California. I, I just love it out here. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you find a place that you come alive. But, and I've got two unique ones. The other one, believe it or not, is New York City. I love the city. Something about being in in that that city is just it just brings me alive. And the same thing happens out here. And there couldn't be more opposite extremes. But maybe that's what I like about them both. So at any rate, kind of like you guys, you know, you only go around life once. So do what makes you happy. And I think that's part of what we talk about here on Travel Evolved is is taking assignments that are financially sound for you, but also taking assignments that you like, places you want to be, around hospitals you've enjoyed in the past or uh, people that, you, that, that are fun to work with. You, you, again, you guys are such a, a wonderful, unique career that you have that I just think it's crazy to not sometimes do some things for you <laughs> you know absolutely we talk a lot about that on Travel Evolved and we're going to continue to and uh, anyway today we're going to talk about being floated amongst other things now this may seem like it's just you know an episode for for nursing but it's not I mean obviously I've got allied friends that work for us that oftentimes you know you're being floated into a different slightly different uh, area of imaging, maybe, uh, maybe a machine that you're not comfortable with. Um, you're being asked to do some things that are maybe outside of your scope of work. That's just all the things we're going to talk about today. The first thing I want to mention, obviously, and this is about as obvious, you know, thanks, Captain Obvious, as they say, is that I'm really not qualified to talk in great deal about the perils of being floated because I'm not an allied professional, I'm not a registered nurse, I'm not a CNA, I'm not a surgical technician that's you know been asked to do a case that's over my head or something I haven't seen before that I'm uncomfortable with. So I, I can't really talk intelligent. This is, again, one of those episodes where I'm going to try to have the conversation get started. I would like people to kind of take it off from there and, and, and put some comments and really start you know taking this episode and start thinking about how you're going to handle this with your career and with your assignment and when, if and when, and if they probably already have, this sort of thing comes up. Maybe you'll be slightly better prepared to decide and deal with how you're going to handle uh, being asked to float, uh, especially if it wasn't something that was brought up into in an interview for you. So I, I just want to point that out. I, listen, I like I think like last week when we were talking about physical fitness. I mean, I'm not a physical fitness expert. I'm certainly not an expert at being floated. I've been doing this for 22 and a half years, so I do understand those phone calls that come. Where you know you get a traveler that calls you and they're they're you guys are lost you're a mess you're you're frustrated you're angry you're scared uh, this is this is your career oops sorry 
And this is your whole, <laughs> it happens once an episode, this is your whole lifestyle uh, and life and livelihood on, on the line. And it's, it's, it's not cool, it's not fun. We're going to talk about today about uh, the lack of understandings oftentimes you'll get from an agency standpoint, what to do about those sorts of things. So let's do some housekeeping. Um, we're going to continue talking about the company and, and the creation of a company and really to try to get you guys on this side. I, you know, I think agencies do a pretty good job of trying to have empathy and sympathy, which are two totally different things for a traveler when you're on assignment. I think we fail at that oftentimes. I really do. And I do think, in all fairness, to be as transparent as I always am, I do think that oftentimes travelers also fail at understanding and having empathy for what it's like to be an agency. It, it, it's just something in our industry. We're considered the machine, the, the, you know, the monster, the, 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 I don't even know how to put it, but it, it's, you always have your guard up against us. And so I want to break down some of those barriers. You know, listen, I love to beat up what we do because I honestly think sometimes our side of the triangle of trust or quadrilateral trust is a little bit ridiculous. I do think we're overcompensated for what it is that we do. We're basically a payroll funding mechanism and we hold revenue. We pay revenue. Hospitals should be, I should say, allowed to, to hold revenue. And it's it just is really weird that us agencies are trying to take more and more of that slice of the pie, which is the bill rate. And I believe that we actually are, are doing less and less. You guys seem to be doing more and more to secure your own assignments, to stay you know, credentialed on your assignments, to, to negotiate you know, extensions and at certain rates. I'm seeing that a lot now. Or, you, know, you guys are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And, of course, once you're on the assignment, last time I checked, you guys are the ones that have your license on the line and your career on the line. So when you're being asked to float, it's a big deal. It really, 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 truly is. So um, it's, it's a lopsided episode. It's another one of those that, that again, I just want to have the conversation get started. And, and please understand that as we go through this episode, I am not trying to put myself in your shoes. I can't. I can do my best, but at, at, at we all know that it's just not the same thing. It isn't even close to being the same thing. I want to talk about what that's like from an agency standpoint. When someone is in that is being floated, and, and what you know your your company is thinking, and how they're going to act and treat you. So, first and foremost, this is incredibly common. Like I said just a few minutes ago, floating in healthcare travel seems to be, and and you guys tell me, put some comments down below. Tell me if it's, this has changed. I haven't seen it. I haven't really had this full on discussion recently with any travelers about floating, but it still does seem to me that the traveler oftentimes is the one that gets dumped on. When it's time to float, because obviously, and, and you know, it, normally, I guess you'd say, they they don't want to put it on their permanent staff because they're going to have to deal with those people for years. They have to deal with you for potentially weeks or months. So let's dump that on the traveler and see if we can get away with it, or let's see what the reaction is, or let's just have it be part of the contract and let's have them discuss that potentially during an interview, maybe, maybe not. So it's it just is part of travel. It has been for as long as I can remember. It's always been one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest complaints. So the first thing I would always tell you guys is this should be brought up on every assignment. I know right now, listen, you're looking at maybe a really high paying assignment because there's some definite you know, differences in pay rates right now in different parts of the country. So you don't necessarily want to put up a warning flag or scare off the person that's potentially going to make the offer to you. I understand that. But if they have, in fact, fallen, quote unquote, in love with you while you're on the interview and you know you're going to get this offer or you're qualified and you look that good on paper and you're feeling like this is really going to happen, it is absolutely important and worthwhile to bring up, hey, by the way, do you, do you, do you tend to have a need to float? And if so, how often and where, where do you typically float to? This is an important decision making factor. And I think any manager who's not willing to openly talk to you about this isn't a good manager because they're going to get a traveler in there and they're going to be unhappy. Let's have the conversation. If you're not the right fit for this assignment or they're not the right fit for you, vice versa, then walk away from it. Sorry. I'm just going to be popular. I'm going to just have to turn this off, I guess. It's a popular day. Walk away from the assignment and say, this is not for me because I can find something else. Yes, I wanted that high pay rate, but that's why maybe it's paying so high because they are, in fact, asking to flow. And if it doesn't make sense and what you hear from that manager scares you or intimidates you or makes you question whether or not you would be worried in that scenario, then walk away. That's the first and foremost thing I'll say, but you got to address it. And it's amazing how oftentimes I'll talk to a traveler and that's in this scenario and I'll say, did, did you guys talk about this? I, I don't know. I don't remember. 
you should remember because if you talked about it, you'd be like, yes, we talked about this, and I was I was either not asked to float, or yes, we talked about this, and you know maybe I was I was misled, or it's more than I thought. But it always surprises me when it wasn't addressed at all. And I do think that on any interview, my recommendation would be to bring this up at some point when you think things are going in the right direction. It shouldn't be the first thing you talk about, just like time off or any other unusual requests you might have. But talking about floating is, I think, vital to your success and overall happiness as a traveler. If you're doing that in every assignment, you'll be less and less surprised. Here's why. If you openly talk about it, that manager and she, let's say he or she said to you, no, we don't float or we only float in this in this area and you were okay with it on the interview. It's really, really hard for them to change that discussion once you get there because they know you were on the phone too. Wait, we didn't. We, you said no floating, or you said I'm only floating into this area. I'm not, you know, if you're an L&D nurse, I'm only floating into, into you know, postpartum. I'm not floating into med surge. We never talked about that. And so you would have that feather in your cap, and you would have that power, if you will, over that interviewer. And I do believe it, it creates the tendency to, to want to float you into other areas that, you, that weren't discussed besides what was talked about. And it just is, it's important. It's like anything else. It's a job interview. So... For anybody who's doing a job interview, asking the questions about what your day-to-day responsibilities will be like, it's going to be really hard for that supervisor or that manager or your quote-unquote boss to say, oh, by the way, I'm going to throw this little wrinkle into it. We never talked about this. If that all makes sense, it is an important thing to address for multiple reasons. And I'm just saying, I'll say it again, it's going to give you a much better quality of your overall travel assignments, your overall travel career. If this is something that you have a little note, and you should have these. We're going to do an episode on interviewing. You should have this kind of thing saying, bring up and talk about floating. So first and foremost, like I said, this is incredibly common. The reason why, obviously, is that, I mean, hospitals do, in fact, get surprised sometimes. They'll have a low census, or they'll have an increase in a census in another part of the hospital. And it's oftentimes not your manager. It is somebody else who is in charge of distribution of cost that is saying, hey, we're paying a really, really high amount for this traveler. And... We need him or her here. We need him or her to run this machine. We need this technician to be part of this procedure because that's what we have on our docket today. It's, it's not an ideal answer, but you guys understand why it happens. They do get surprised sometimes. Oftentimes, it's not a surprise. Oftentimes, these hospitals are, are ran in chaos. I've mentioned before, in, in 22 years, you start to know hospitals that have that reputation. And what's really wild to me, you would think over a couple of decades that there would be different management and things would change. And I have seen, by the way, in all fairness, I have seen some that no longer have that reputation. So that tells you they were either purchased by another organization, parent company, or somehow they did in fact change their overall persona by probably internally out, we'll see. But there are those hospitals that I'm not kidding, 22 years later are still the same monster They were 22 years ago, and it just makes you scratch your head and say, wow, how can you function and run that way? And some of them just do. They run and function in chaos. It's oftentimes thrust upon them because of maybe seasonality or because of the busyness of that that particular location, that facility. It's hard to say why, but it is a real thing that some of them just run. Some managers in great hospitals don't prepare and don't anticipate changes or problems or or census increases and decreases so they either are surprised that they don't need you or they're pulling your manager and saying i need him or her over here to do this it's it just is the way it is and again unfortunately if it's not being discussed interview you as a traveler have the tendency to be the first one to be asked or forced potentially to to be floated so it just is the way as i say it is all right first and foremost the thing I want to say, I guess I already said first and foremost. So secondly, and, and probably the, one of the most important parts of this is that, in my opinion, this is your decision. I am not telling you anything that you don't already know. So this is where I kind of feel a little bit silly talking to the experts. And you guys are, in fact, the experts. But just to remind you, you're in charge. Don't ever do anything that makes you uncomfortable. This is your career. It's not just assignment. I don't care if it's the best paying assignment in the world and you're worried about making the facility mad, making your favorite agency mad or burning a bridge with a manager you really like and care about and and having the whole thing go south, it's okay. Let it go south because it is, in fact, an assignment. It is not 
a career. If you're you know, a permanent staff, you don't have those options. You're walking away potentially from an assignment if you're going to refuse. And by the way, the results may not be as bad as you think. They may be saying, well, this person has a backbone and some courage, and I understand why he or she is unwilling to float, and I'm going to respect that. I've seen that too. So it is your decision. You are completely in charge. This is your career. And you know, for all you new travelers, understand that as you go down the line and get, gain more and more experience, you're going to be less and less likely to just go, okay, and go along with it. Because lots of times I've seen people going along with it, whether we're talking about floating or other things, and they find themselves in a bit of a pickle, and then they're being asked, well, why didn't you question some things? And this is a good example of that. You don't want to be in a scenario where, you know, God forbid, something goes, goes wrong, and someone says, well, why didn't you let somebody know that this area of expertise or this, uh, you know, this procedure or this machine or this, you know, all the different nuances was in over your head. And I do know that that's also a thing because you don't want to be sitting there discussing it with, with some, some, I guess, boards or higher ups that are, are going to question you. And you guys all know covering their own fannies and having you be the one saying, well, why didn't you tell us if you don't, you raise your voice and tell us. So this is your call. It's not your company's call. It's not your recruiter's call. They may tell you it is. It's not the facility's call. All those people may want to influence you and let you know this is it. Patient abandonment and all these different things. Baloney. This is your career and you are in charge. And most of you guys know this. And I think the older and longer you've been traveling, not the older, but the longer of the time, I mean, the more um, thicker your skin gets and the more resilient you become to uh, being influenced and being asked to do something that makes you completely uncomfortable. All right, one of the things you should be thinking about is does your agency have a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week liaison for you to communicate with that understands your specialty? It's one thing if you're, you know, if you're a nurse and you're talking to an ER nurse and you're an ER nurse, but if you're, a, if you're in rehabilitation and you're a PT and you're calling in, you know, do they have somebody that understands the procedures that you're dealing with? Do they have somebody 24 hours a day, seven days a week that you can call? Because this stuff obviously happens at 2 o'clock in the morning. And if your recruiter is sleeping or if your company isn't answering their phone and there's nobody there that's on call to take these kinds of, of calls, you're on your own. And you've got to make a decision completely on your own without knowing whether or not you have the support of your company and what's going to happen if the assignment is instantly terminated. That's an important thing. And one of the things you should be talking and asking your agency about before you sign on. I know we, there's a lot to think about. And there's a lot to consider when choosing an assignment and choosing an agency. But in my opinion, this is one of those. Especially if you're in a department that tends to get floated a lot, uh, you're in a high acuity, you know, it, the, your specialty will dictate, in my opinion, I guess what I'm saying is how important this knowledge of what your company has to offer will, will weigh upon your decision on which company to use. That'll make sense. More and more companies need to have, you know, liaisons. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing how many don't surprises me every day big companies that don't have anybody who you could call at two o'clock in the morning if the house super calls and says you're doing this and you're like what so ask those questions and get that information get that number before you actually take the assignment say who is it i'm going to be talking to at two o'clock in the morning that's going to let me know it has some understanding of what i'm dealing with it's going to let me know what i'm doing you know it doesn't mean you have to go to work for those companies but i think you should know whether or not you have that option and it should, I think, be part of the weighing in on the, the type of company or the actual company that you're using because it could be one of the most important aspects of it. Hopefully not. But uh, again, like I say, if a company doesn't have it, I guess you got to decide how important that is because if you, they don't, you're on your own and that decision is totally going to be made by you. Okay, here's my aha moment for this episode. Your recruiter, for the most part, unless they've been in healthcare themselves, don't have a clue what you're going through and what you're experiencing. They don't understand. I don't understand, like I said earlier. So when you call your recruiter, here's here's just my blunt answer. And again, I hope you guys I hope you guys like me for this because this is what I think most of you listen to for the first thing your recruiter's thinking is, my commission's going away. My commission's going away. She's gonna be upset. He's gonna be upset because they're gonna ask to float and I'm gonna lose this placement. I'm gonna lose commission. I'm gonna lose money. I'm telling you Hear me now, believe me later. For 99% of your recruiters, that's the first thing that goes through their head. Anytime that you call them 
with something you're upset about. That is the first reaction. And I'm telling you this from an agency standpoint, from walking around on the floor with 20 recruiters around me and they're getting that call and you see them, they're just like, this is what you're not going to see in here. No agency is going to film that happening. Trust me. You're not going to see that in everyone's social media. You're not going to see it on my social media. It's that kind of reaction. So when you call your recruiter, yeah, they're going to try to help because they're, they don't want you to be upset and they want you to stay and stick around the assignment and extend and, and continue with them. But as far as understanding the fear you have or the uncertainty if there is or just the frustration or even the downright anger that you're experiencing on this question of being floated as someplace that you either don't want to or aren't qualified for and there are there is a difference I'll talk about here in a sec understand that they don't know what you're going through and i think i hope that's kind of a little bit of a of a of an aha moment for you where you're like oh that makes sense now because they're not thinking that way. So that's why I'm trying to tell you, if you have somebody who does understand, it makes a world of difference. Because now it's not about commission, even though they may be working for that company or may somehow be compensated by that company if they're you know, out, out, of, the, out of the actual office and maybe working um, you know, remote kind of thing. As some, a lot of agencies do that. I think there's nothing wrong with that. They're going to be the ones that are going to at least have a better idea and some clarity as to what really does make sense for you as opposed to having that commission thing in the back of your mind, which I've always said is probably the biggest stumbling block between a recruiter and a traveler. That is the, the problem you cannot get rid of. And nobody out there can convince me ever that that little relationship glitch isn't there. And it's because one of you is making money off of the other one still staying with the company. And you, you'd say, well, I'm making money too from the company. Yeah, are you? I mean, you, the, there's other places to make money. But if you go away, that recruiter doesn't have another option to make money off of you. So like it or not, that is always a little bit of a wedge in the best relationships I've seen between an agency and a recruiter, I'm sorry, a traveler and a recruiter. On a best case scenario, that is that little tiny you know nugget is just a little a little grain of sand or a pebble, but for some it's huge because some recruiters are driven solely by money, and you guys can probably tell the difference. Or you've got a recruiter who's really really good at hiding what their drive is. I've seen that. I've, I've, I've watched that. I've witnessed that. I've had people employed by my company that are amazingly good at not not projecting that commission financially driven motivation that they have and they actually can pull it off really really well i'm not trying to be unfair i'm trying to be really fair and totally transparent with you guys as i always am because it happens it doesn't mean that every recruiter is only out for money but i mean if it's your career why would they be any different than you you are trying to earn as much money as you can out of your assignment wow that's got to be getting so irritating to you guys i'm so sorry i need to just turn that phone off it's got to just be tough every time you, you listen to me. That thing probably is louder than, than you know what. So anyway, that's part of it. And it's just, it is just the reality. You're not, you can't escape that. And it's one of the things that's really difficult in our, in, our, in our world, in our industry, is that there's always that professional relationship, no matter how personal the relationship gets. You can't avoid it. And it's, it's one of those things that um, is just a tough part of, of you know, being in travel. So bottom line is that your recruiter's not going to understand. What you're going through so you've got to try to take it a little bit different way and just realize that when you're calling on not just this problem but any problem the first reaction is going to be they're going to try to figure out how to salvage you for personal potentially reasons and of course i, th I do think there's a lot of people that out there want you to not be scared or worried so there's it's not to say that it's only about commission but it is one of the first things that pops in their head so like I said earlier, was this discussed during the interview? That's an important question that you now need to be asked. Because that's the first thing that I've ever asked anybody that's, that's worked you know, with me or for me is, hey, this is, I don't know. I was on the phone. And so you're calling me because you're upset about being asked to float to an area. My first question is, did they talk to you about this? And if they did, was, it, was this specific float discussed? So in other words, are you being floated and you're just now you're just upset about the fact that you said okay and you took the assignment and you knew that there was a potential? That's a whole different conversation. Right or wrong, it's a different conversation. No, this is completely out of the blue and we never discussed it. I did ask and this person even said that there, there's either no floating or I wouldn't be floated to this kind of area. Totally different reaction and totally different posturing that can be done by your agency on your behalf in order to fix this problem. 
So that's why I said earlier how important it really, really is. So here's the, the things. First of all, as I said, this is your decision. So the first thing also would be, what is your level of comfort with this? Is this something, and there's two different answers to this. Is this something you just don't want to do because it sucks or because it's boring or because it's, it's more work or it's a pain? Or is this something truly that you cannot do and you're worried about having the qualifications? It's out of your scope of work, like I've said, and this is something you're worried about. I think those are also two very different scenarios. And I think you should be honest with your agency about it. If it's something you just don't want to do, that's a whole different conversation. It doesn't mean you couldn't do it once and then they could handle this with you the next day and handle it at the facility and talk about it. It's another whole thing to say, I don't want to do one second of this float because I'm worried about doing something wrong and having it affect my entire career. Two totally different scenarios. And I think being honest with your company and not exaggerating your level of comfort just because you don't like to do something is an important, I think, relationship builder between you and your company. So kind of keep that in mind. But there are two totally different, I guess, um, outcomes to this. And I, and I think that a good company, listen, this is what we deal with. This is why companies make the kind of margins they make. This is why you hopefully make the kind of money you're making. And I am not on this podcast telling you to just float and deal with it. I'm saying that you need to look at, can I? Am I willing to? Is this something that I'm totally being dumped on solely? Is this something that this hospital does to all travelers? Can I get through this? Is the money and the assignment worth this float? Or am I going to burn a bridge and walk away because of floating? So all these things have to come into play. And this is where I, you have to treat this like it's your own business. How does this affect my brand, right? So think about it that way. If I walk from this or I'm unwilling, is this going to affect me going forward with this system, with this facility, with this agency I may like, like we talked about a few episodes ago? Am I going to be not able to work for a company that I really, really like or potentially a hospital system that I really, really like or that's available in the area that I always want to go to or close to home or a certain state that they're, they're prevalent in? All of these factors need to come into, into play. And I know it's hard because you're at the you're in your you know on the assignment, you're actually at work and you've got to make a relatively snap decision on this. Take a break, go and if you can, give give yourself five minutes, put the, your thoughts down on paper, see how, you know, do a Ben Franklin, which is the pros and cons and the pluses and the minuses. And if the one of them heavily outweighs the other one, then you're gonna have your own answer. And it's it's an important decision to make because it's not just about Sticking with your gun, saying I'm just not going to float. I think this day and age, and in, in you know, and like I said, this thing is episode in 2022. Things may have changed, and the money you're making may say to you, "All right, I'm willing to do something that maybe isn't my fir- first choice. I may do it frequently during the course of this assignment because I'm making a ton of money, or I really love this location." Or it may be that, no, this assignment is not that a strong paying. I don't particularly like it here. It's just an assignment to me, and I am absolutely categorically unwilling to float to this area because I don't want to or because I'm unqualified. None of those are anybody else's decision but yours, which means none of those decisions are wrong. You're going to make the right decision each and every time as long as you're giving, you're giving yourself the option to be able to really think through that. So, you know, all these things should be considered. Floating is a tough it's a tough part of being a traveler oftentimes. I, it, it, you'd think it wouldn't be, but if we pull ourselves back and start thinking about how travelers became travelers and how the industry and, and, and hospitals and facilities are ran and how travel health care has become part of it, it is understandable to know that it's because of the money that's involved uh, and how it has just evolved again and that this does make sense that oftentimes you guys are the ones that are being asked to do things that they're not wanting to or willing to ask their permanent staff because there's a long-term effect there. So I think if you if you look at this openly and say, I, I do understand it, and I think that's what you guys always have to do. I've really done my best as you know to run a company to really think about all scenarios. And it's a, it's a work in progress. That's always what I'm doing because that's what people come to me with. They come to me with their problem and their solution that helps them, right? And there's always another side of this thing. And I think if we're able to look at why it is we're being asked for, what's going on? Is this manager in trouble in this unit and they, and they literally have nothing else to do and it, there's a patient involved and you could maybe go and help or, or sit or watch or do something that's, that's in your scope of work, I think addressing it and looking at it that way could, could help. Now, again, I'm not telling you to do it. You're in charge. So 
don't just accept it and do it and don't just say no and refuse to do it. Look at some of the gray area there and see if it makes sense on a case by case scenario. So, all right, a couple of things I want to talk about real quick. I always like to throw these nuggets at the end. That's what I'm probably going to start doing, you know, force you guys to listen to the boring stuff till we get to the meat and potatoes. But first and foremost, I want to let you guys, let you guys know I really would love you to, if you like what we're talking about on these podcasts, and I think I even said maybe it was last week, sometimes it's hard to get visual. You know, information out there. It's hard to, to do it when I'm just sitting here talking. And one of the things that the team has talked a lot about is that we're really going to start building the Travel Evolved Facebook group. So if you haven't joined Travel Evolved on Facebook, go there. I think you have to still have to request to, to be a part of it. Hit hit uh, you know request to join, and they'll they'll get you on board there. A lot of things are going to start changing. This has primarily just been a I guess a club to really talk about when we're releasing episodes and that sort of thing. It hasn't been a lot of content uh, in that Facebook marketing page, and there's about ready to be. So we've had a lot of discussions recently about putting some visuals, putting some actual examples, having you know calculators that would show you margin calculators and things that you could actually download and play around with so you guys would understand, which is unheard of in our industry. A lot of visual aids, more full explanation stuff where you know maybe we take an episode. Uh, that we struggled with or a concept and we have a quick, you know, two minute, three minute, you know, sorry, summarization. I got to, I got to do this. Sorry, I got to get the, the vitamin B water because uh, I'm just choking here. Get, um, get a little bit more detailed explanation or maybe if someone says in a comment that they, that I, I misspoke, which happens all the time or something didn't make sense, we can go and start to actually put some real valuable content on that page. We're going to have some fun. I think it's important to mix it up on a page too. Some fun stuff and some helpful stuff that maybe isn't even a topic on Travel Evolved. Maybe it's an, uh, a little ditty that doesn't merit a full you know, episode to be covered on, but something we think is kind of important. So I would urge all of you guys, if as, a, as more of a companion to this, but maybe even the lead, and this might be the companion, is to go ahead and ask to be part of uh, Travel Evolved because I think you're going you're gonna to find that it's going to start to have a lot of really good content. Again, things you just aren't going to see anywhere else and open, transparent information that would be important. So that's kind of my plug for that. So bottom line is that, like I said last week, we're going to start talking a little bit about the creation of a company. I kind of teased you guys last week and said, you know, that's that's where we were and where we are. Briefly, I want to just tell you a little bit about my history because I think it's kind of important so you kind of know, and we'll talk about this once and then thankfully we're never going to talk about it again. Real briefly, I have a bachelor's degree from Florida State University in advertising and marketing. So what I'm doing in travel nursing, I have no idea. It's actually kind of wild because it was a fun industry for me. I, I got into um, marketing and advertising briefly, loved it. It was very fast-paced, very exciting, high risk, um, just what you think of. And it was, you know, it, it was a really wild career that I really wanted to get involved with. I didn't, I didn't really enjoy the creativity part because I wasn't very good at that part, but I enjoyed the sales aspect of it. And um, the customer service part was, was good, too, because you'd get people that, you know, really wanted to critique their, their advertising, whether it was on TV or in print, and they, they had opinions, and it was just fun to uh, help them kind of get their brand out and do their sort of things that, they, that was fun. So I did that for a little while and um, ended up in healthcare staffing, primarily for a travel nursing company, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But... Um, you know, I've done some crazy things in my life. When I was in college, I was a disc jockey for a couple of years, which ironically, I think, lends itself to doing something like this because, if I mean, for those of you that know, listen, this was back in the, oh, God, I'm going to date myself, the late 80s. It was a dull contemporary station, so, and I did it while I was in school. I was just, it, was a, it was a summer job that turned into another job, and it was kind of fun because I could do it in when I wasn't in class, but... I mean, it was, it was a lot of organization. You, you did commercials. You had a thing called carts, which are basically like an eight-track. And you'd have your commercials, and it'd be three little slots and machines. So it was a lot of timing. You'd have some turntables. You had to do an announcement, throw in a couple of national, national ads, move into local stuff, make sure that was all queued up in time to have your music ready to go, have all the playlists ready to go, do some you know filler talking, and make sure you kept the audience engaged, but not too much. So it, for me, it was kind of a, a start of... What this has become, I think, and I said last week that it feels to me when I had this epiphany that everything I've done in my life has kind of led me to this. This was part of it. I thought about, you know, it's kind of interesting that I'll start doing or continue doing more media because I've had experience with that. Between my advertising background and between, you know, just that brief moment of, uh, you know, being on the radio, it, it, it allows, I think, for some 
better conversations on things like this, which means I don't have to practice. I don't have to do a script. Throw that in there with 22 years of experience. It's like you guys talking about what it is that you do. You wouldn't have to be scripted. You would, you know, someone give you a topic. There'd be some things you want to remember, which is the bullet points we put down. But the rest of it's got to be free formed and, and come from the heart and come from what you really think. And that's where this kind of lent, lent itself to. So. When I had that epiphany about what we wanted to do, I'm like, this kind of does fill, you know, fit along with it because there is a marketing aspect to creating a new company. You don't, don't just, I mean, I shouldn't say that. A lot of companies just form and here they are and they just start posting jobs on Facebook and they start, you know, having their recruiters start calling and texting and doing those sort of things. We see those companies all the time. And many of them become very successful because they work really, really hard at being successful. But most companies have some kind of a marketing mix uh, in them. So it's kind of interesting when you're creating something brand new. And for those of you that are, one of the first things I started thinking about was with the creation of this new company, what kind of marketing is going to go along with it? And that's when we said, not that Travel Evolve would be, but just the things that we have done with our company that were part of it. It's, it's, um, it had to be unique. It had to be different. It had to be something that you didn't see all the time. And I find it kind of interesting that if you really look at our industry, there's a ton of let's say recruiters, for example, job posting, right? How many companies out there are really doing marketing and advertising? Very, very few. It's expensive as all get out to start with. It's time consuming. Uh, a lot of travel agencies, frankly, don't understand marketing. They're not in that. It's almost like the people that get into healthcare staffing that are marketing people don't understand the way travelers think. So it's kind of a unique perspective. You kind of have to understand both. You have to understand what makes travelers tick and what motivates them and how unique and niche this group is and how much you guys communicate with each other and talk. But you also have to understand how things are marketed and how people start to try new things, try new companies, try new concepts, move from one agency to the other, move from one assignment to the other. So there's a lot of moving parts pretty simplistic, but it actually becomes complicated because of the nature of those two industries kind of clashing, if that makes sense to you guys. Travel, you know, when you're marketing to travelers, you're not marketing to healthcare professionals because you're going to spend a ton of money wasting your time dealing with people that are never going to take a contract. So you, you can't do that. Some companies do. And they sit there, I guess they're trying to convince people to end their careers mid midlife and with children at home and commitments and everything else or have no interest in even taking on this nomadic lifestyle. And they're going to try to convince them too. I think that's a mistake. So for those of you that are looking at becoming your own agency, I wouldn't spend a lot of money trying to convince people to travel. I would try to spend money convincing those people that are traveling to give your company a chance and a shot. And that's what all of us basically are trying to do one way, shape, or form. But isn't it interesting to me, or to you guys, it is to me, I guess, that there's not a lot of actual, real marketing of a company out there. Branding is really important. Um, and if you think about why, it's because people don't really have a brand. Our industry is full of companies without a brand. You tell me right now, and, and answer this question to yourself, Give me five things that are the brand and why you're working for the company you're working with that are different from every other company out there. There should be five things that that company is striving for, whether they're hitting it on all four cylinders or not. Name five things, if you can't, that tells you what you need to know is that it may be a great company, but they're really not uniquely different from another, another company that does this very same thing. And most industries in our world do have some differentiation. That's what makes a company different. But it's so ironic to me and, and crazy to me, like we've always said, that our, our industry is full of mirror images of itself when it comes to our side of the desk. It's very similar. And there's people out there going, no, it's not. Really? How many companies have you personally gone through? You may have found the one you like. And I would tell you, if you do, stick with that company. And there's no reason to try mine or anybody else's. If you love the way things are working, then We've learned in our industry not to sit there and go out and try to change it because you could really you know, go out of the frying pan to the fire or you could really find something that's just terrible. If you like what you're doing, where you're working and the company you're working for, the facilities you're working through, then stay with that. There's no real reason to change it. Oh, my gosh, in my opinion. <laughs> it's the last time, I promise. I can't shut it off. But I, I, it's a long story. My phone doesn't have a – it won't go on to vibrate, which is really drives me nuts. So anyway. That's part of the reason why you don't see a lot of branding out there with companies because, in my personal opinion, everybody's doing the same thing. And they're trying to convince you guys that what they're doing is somehow better than the company that's doing the exact same thing. I mean, step back and really look at it. 
you guys aren't necessarily loyal to a brand, which is, it's not good or bad, it's the facts, because there's not a lot of difference. What you guys are loyal to is an assignment based upon a certain pay rate for that assignment. So that's what you're looking for. Where can I make the most money and who has it? And of who has it, which company am I familiar with? Which sounds the best? And I talk to that recruiter or that company, which one do I kind of like and let's go. That's kind of the way I feel most of you guys have, have moved your your travel and assignment prepping tort. And I think that's it's that's kind of it's wild to think about. So all of this went through my head and I wanted to briefly talk about that history of, of where I came from because I think it's kind of interesting. I was actually hired, and I'll talk about them more of this next week. I was actually hired by a pretty big company to do their marketing. That's how I really got in this business. Um, and I'll talk more about that last week. Or gosh, did I say it out loud? I'll talk about that next week because I think it's kind of important. That's how I found myself in this wild, wacky world. And I really, by the way, I'll give you this little preview. I thought it would only be a job a shortest job to be at best. And I certainly thought, you know, it would be a, a company I'd work for for three or four years and then I would probably be back in advertising because I was going to market this. And once you get something marketed, you know, you kind of work yourself a little bit out of a job, especially if you're internal. I had no idea that I would still be doing this this long and have this kind of a of a career in this in this industry because it just, I never, ever anticipated that. So... Anyway, guys, I appreciate you as always. We're going to keep talking about this, and then uh, we're going to start delving into a lot more. i got some really good episodes. I'm trying to coordinate some guests. I had to make some changes in the schedule, so I'll probably have a few guests on a row because I, I, want to, I like to break those up, but it just with us being out here and some of the, the time differences, by the way, which are now three hours apart, it was kind of difficult to get that coordinated. So we're going to get that done. Awesome episodes coming up. You guys are going to love them, I think. I hope you do. Go to Travel Evolved on Facebook. Look at us. Look us up um, and give us a join. You're going to see some really great stuff coming on there in the next weeks and months. And I think you're going to find it really, really helpful and even potentially more helpful than, than listening to uh, these podcasts because it's going to be right there, nuts and bolts stuff. Guys, I'll catch you next time, as always, on Travel Evolved. <laughs>